Revenues were down more, 37% than M&A activity, which was down 18%. You got a lot of questions, of course, on the call about that. What's the answer for why you were only not down, only where you were down more than the market? You know, look, M&A, it's a, it's, a, it's a long cycle business, number one. And when we, when we created the company, I, I purposely went out, we don't give guidance at all because what's 12 weeks of M&A when you're trying to build a firm based on advice? Advice is a long-term relationship. And M&A are big generational risks that companies take. And look, I, I think I've gone out of my way to create a company that has the opportunity to say no to a deal as well as yes. And I think it's very interesting how much of the industry's uh, uh, success is based on saying yes to transactions versus thinking through truly asymmetric risks are in the market and giving long-term advice. Right. So when you say to a client, we really don't think you should do this, which of course means near term, you're not going to get a fee that you otherwise might. Right. So when you sit here and ask me about my success on a 12-week period, really our success is did we give good advice because 10 years from now, that'll be what counts. You know, it's when I started the firm, I used to say to our partners, let me give you some advice. Never go to a brain surgery with a big mortgage who's on commission. Uh, you might not want to trust the, uh, the resulting advice. And I think the whole system about financial advice is now set up with, you know, heavily levered, high fixed cost companies with commission-based bonus pools, and I'm not sure that's the best environment. Right, although as a public company now for what, five years at this point, 10 years, years since you founded the company, five years as a public company, it can't be particularly nice to watch your stock price drop dramatically as a result of a revenue decline where everybody's still asking you these same questions. No, but actually, it doesn't affect me that, you know, look, I'm in it for the long haul. It's a, it's a, it's a long-term investment for me. And really, what I think about is, are we delivering quality? Are we connecting with our clients? Did we give good advice? David, there could have been parts of that. And I said, part of it was uh, specific to our firm that we did not have transactions complete. I didn't mean that as a negative. I actually said it very purposely. Some of that's a positive. Some of that is we said slow down. Some of that is possibly deals that didn't happen that, you know, I'm not saying all of it was. But I, I really do assess the firm on the quality and the consistency and, and the value of our relationships more than any 12-week period. I want to get back to, to the company itself, but broadly speaking about the M&A environment right now, as we, we're, what, a month away from wrapping up uh, the first half of the year, uh, what are you hearing in boardrooms? What are you hearing in terms of confidence from the CEOs, their willingness to actually do a deal, particularly in light of the ratcheting up of tensions with China and the overall concerns in the marketplace? It's interesting. I, you know, you're asked, it's, people ask that question as if every risk is the same. I was thinking about this. The fourth quarter risk, the October, November, December market, was really a risk that the market had seen a recession coming. I think the Fed was saying they were going to raise two more times. And the downturn in the market and the volatility was about a coming recession. That very much more hits middle market M&A, which is based more on leverage, access to capital, and, and economy. I think what you're seeing in this new environment is, and by the way, I think that kind of settled out when the Fed said we might cut rather than raise. What you're seeing in this volatility is a, is a macro risk, China trade war, uh, regulatory risk, nationalism, elections, and I think that affects strategic large cap more. Large cap does not worry about leverage or access to capital. They think about strategy and, and, and large impacts such as a long-term China trade war. And so I think you're seeing two very different responses to what maybe people see as the same volatility. But I think it's different volatility. So meaning we should not expect to see any large cross-border kinds of deals or not many of them, and perhaps to, to the point you're making, some of the larger strategic deals that we've become accustomed to seeing? Yeah, I, I, look, I do because M&A is a very asymmetric risk reward. I think on, when you're right, you have sort of linear progression of the company, and when you're wrong, it could be, you know, very exponentially wrong as, you know, some of the past mergers that you're, you, know, you and I are aware of. Look, with the China trade war hanging out of, out there, I do think you have to think, okay, we might all think there's a 9 or an 8 out of 10 chance. I might even disagree with that, that this settles out. Right. But the consequence of the other 20% is too large to enter into a very illiquid long-term risk. I mean, certainly if you're 
deal requires Chinese antitrust approval well, then, or, frankly, U.S. at this point. I yeah. mean, who knows where that goes? Well, then it's the other way. Then it's 90-10. Right. You're not, you can't do it. You can't do it. Obviously I mean, no board's going to take, at this point, very few boards, I would think, would be willing to take that risk. And when you're dealing with technology deals, they often will need Chinese antitrust. Well, just to give you a flavor, in 2016, I think we did 15 transactions from China outward into the U.S. and Europe. In the last 12 months, it's close to zero. And it's all, so we were very active in the market. Right. Almost impossible to tell a public company board to enter the risk of getting Chinese approval right now. But you also, it's funny, on the call, I know you talked a bit, you were, seemed a bit stumped by the lack of activity in Europe as well. I yeah. mean, is that going to continue? I, I won't quote you here, but you just basically were like, you know, I'm not quite sure I get it either. It's a pretty big economy, nothing going on. Well, yeah, stump might not be the right word, but, you know... Uh, uh, okay, not that you're ever stumped. No, Ken. I'm just saying, I'm, you know, amazed that it's a big... I mean, as an economy, it's as big as the U.S. taken as a whole. Right. But, you know, you're having these elections and nationalism and Brexit, and it's just not uh, creating transactions. But, look, Germany's entering into recession. Italy's in recession. You, you have these different things going on, and, and Europe's difficult. I would just say that Europe is a much more difficult market than most people dream it to be. Well, you're not painting a pretty picture for the second half of this year so far. It's not, Terry. I think some of the big cap strategic will go away, but I think that the signal from October, November, December was truncated by the Fed saying we're not going to raise twice. So I do think most of the market is not value, uh, looking at recession risk anymore, but I think the large part of the market might be looking at strategic macro risk. Right. And, well, you guys operate, them obviously, middle, but you're also up dealing with... And they've gotten... Some of your deals have gotten larger over time as you sort of be, become a firm that's uh, aged a bit through the years as yeah, well. Yeah, but I think the vast... The middle today was what we used to call large. I mean, the middle is, you right. know, up to $10 billion, I think, is considered middle market, $500 million to $10 billion. Those transactions are humming along. Remember... The amount of money being allocated into the private equity world is just mind-boggling. It is, but they, but they, I mean, there are deals here and there, but we keep, you know, dry powder. That I hate uh, the word. I, I hate it, too. And that's all you hear, because it stayed dry. But, but, look, they're in the business of buying and selling assets. So when you raise a $25 billion fund, you're sort of indicating that in the next five years, you're going to buy $100 billion of assets. Right. And then if you hit your rate of return... You're sort of indicating that two to three years after that, you're going to sell 300 billion of assets. That's a half a trillion dollars of M&A. And there's, what, six or seven funds of that, and there are 8,000. I'm just saying there's a lot of activity in that part of the market, and, um, and I think it's... So you think financial sponsors will, will be more have active? To. I mean, you've got to believe it. Right, it is I mean, their business. It's like asking, is Walmart going to sell bananas? Right. The answer is it's their business. Right. We, we won't talk about levered S&P returns versus the returns on your P.E. firms. Back to Mollison Company, though, in terms of how you manage a, a how do you manage a period like this in terms of headcount? I know one analyst on the call, Michael Needham, was saying, look, over a long period, the last five years, your headcount's up 80 percent, but your number of transactions is up only 17 percent. Yeah, it was interesting because I don't know what he was talking about. But OK, I do. Um, look, we are we've grown the firm to 800 plus million of revenue. And we think we can double it again in the, in the future. But I will tell you that one of the things that I think will prevent that is a complacent bull market. You've been around a long time. I've been around a long time. And what happens in these markets is people inch out on the risk spectrum. And look, I think that's what our job is in M&A, too, is to tell people, look, this, there's an implicit risk out there. We run the company with no leverage, no guarantees, very low fixed costs. The desire is to be able to, first of all, have no pressure on our bankers to give advice just to pull forward a, a fee structure into a bonus pool. We, we've tried to set up the firm to be owners and give ownership type advice. And I think we're living that in our own business, which is to, is to be careful. And I think there's always a, a moment in time when things get over their skis we want to be ready to take advantage of that moment and accelerate our growth. But that, and that is, the, that is the plan, is to stay very, uh, very unlevered, very nimble, and take advantage of opportunities. And what's the plan for you? You're going to stay at the helm of this company that you founded 10 years ago, Public Five? You're still a young man. I say that now more and more often, given how old we're all getting. Look, I think it's one of the only businesses in the world you get better with age. Um, thank God I'm not a football player. You know, you, you get a very short term at this. You know, having seen 40 years of deals, I think will make it makes you better for the next 10. So 
I love the business. I love the quality of the people we interact with. I love being with young people who are trying to change the world. They're starting to come back to finance, which is really exciting. Are they? they are. The young people have realized that if you want to change the world, actually doing it the way we're doing it is, is much more effective than starting at the bottom of a large tech company and focusing on what the color of a button would be on the screen. And um, so we're starting to get really great people back in our, in the firm uh, out of school. So I'm excited about it. I've just said that I shouldn't be the CEO of the company five years from now. And it's, it's because I want young people to, to see a chance to get ahead. And I want them to know there's a shot for them. And, and so I'm going to, I'll be in the firm and I'll be doing deals, but I hope somebody else will be CEO. All right.